So I'm going to start here by getting a, a shot with my FreshBooks hoodie on, because I forgot to add a logo to my slides. So this is how I'm going to deal with that. And then also, uh, I feel like as the last speaker, it's kind of like I'm going through a Spartan obstacle course, because I have to get through the day without getting coffee on myself. So this was my armor through the day, but I'm going to take it off now if it's OK. So let's get going. Oops. OK, so I'm Anya Halyup, and I'm a director of engineering at FreshBooks. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a journey we took last year at FreshBooks that's helping us scale our engineering department. And I'm going to share with you the eight steps that we took along the way and how you can apply them to your own org. Um, as Inmar said, scaling and building engineering organizations is one of my passions as is learning and collaborating with others and uh, creating a change that ultimately helps us all succeed. So I joined FreshBooks in the spring of 2014. And since then, our engineering department has about doubled in size and we're still continuing to grow. So about, about a year ago, I was having lunch in the cafeteria with a colleague of mine. And we we're sharing stories about our individual career paths. And he admitted to me that now that he was a senior engineer at FreshBooks, it wasn't clear to him what his next step should be. So he was interested in staying technical and becoming an architect. But when he brought this up to his team lead, his team lead had no advice and no feedback on him on what his next step should be. So as a result, he was considering the management path instead and abandoning his plans to become an architect. So just to let you know, a team lead at FreshBooks is a bit of a hybrid role where the person's both a technical lead and also manages the developers. They all report to him or her. Uh, so they're also an individual contributor. So they wear a lot of hats, to say the least. So in any case, this conversation really concerned me because I had started managing a lot of the team leads at the time. And the more I worked with them, the more I realized that a lot of them weren't actually interested in management at all, but had taken the role because they felt it was only their possible next steps as well. So this was a real problem as we had a lot of initiatives that we wanted to be kicking off and a relatively reluctant cast of characters to run them. And we also had lots of technical problems and not enough senior technical people to work on them. And as we continued to scale, it became more and more critical that we had the right people in the right roles and that we were supporting their career to keep them at FreshBooks. So in this particular case, you'll be glad to know, my uh, colleague actually didn't become a team lead at FreshBooks. Uh, he quit the following month, and he went to another company where he was able to follow his dream. And this obviously really depressed me when I thought back to the conversation I had had with him. But what made it even worse, and what made me feel even worse, is that a very similar conversation and a very similar outcome occurred with someone else a few months later. So we were losing high-performing senior engineers because we did, they didn't see a future at FreshBooks. Interesting. So, slides are not working. <laughs> okay. Uh, slides aren't working. If you could go to click it so that it goes to the next slide, please. Okay, so... Okay. Thank you. Can you go back to slide three, please? So I'm just going to stop a moment and say that for a lot of people, public speaking is actually uh, something they fear more than death. Uh, luckily, I'm not one of these people because this literally would be pretty annoying right now. Okay, so like many companies, FreshBooks cares about career development, and we had previously created a career ladder which allowed us to support engineers for many years. But just like software grows organically and often needs to be refactored at some point, so often do career ladders. Uh, so the first step that we needed to take was identifying that we needed to make some changes. So do any of these sound familiar to you? Your high performers are leaving faster than other people. Your recruitment and promotion processes aren't consistent, and they're resulting in different outcomes depending on who's involved. So for example, sometimes your, uh, your hiring practices are resulting in good hires, and sometimes not, depending on who's doing the interviewing. One path, whether it be technical or management, is dominating over the other. Your scaling philosophy is relying heavily on hiring versus growing talent. And you have an unbalanced distribution of levels. So example, you might have too many juniors or not enough seniors. 
So looking deeper, I realized that in actual fact, our engineering ladder, our organizational structure, and our processes had not evolved to keep pace with our organization. So what this meant was that we weren't flexible enough to support emergent and existing talent. We didn't give enough opportunities for our senior engineers to explore and gradually build up management skills. It wasn't obvious to them how they could progress in a, to an engineering manager and beyond. What in fact happened, they became a team lead and then they became stuck. And like my uh, colleague earlier, they didn't see a path forward on the technical path, so they assumed it wasn't really viable at FreshBooks. And also, as an engineering leadership team, we weren't aligned on the expectations and the, for different roles and levels, which meant that our hiring and promotion processes weren't consistent, and as we scaled and became bigger, this had the potential of becoming more and more of a problem. So this meant that not only did we need to update our engineering career ladder, we also had to make big changes to our promotion and recruitment processes. So step two was doing research. This is a fun part for everyone, I think. So once I had realized that these changes needed to be made, I started doing research at other companies. Obviously, every company is going to be different, and you're going to have different problems you're trying to solve and different goals you're trying to meet. But through my research, I was able to gain a lot of learnings about people's universal need for clarity and progression in their careers. So we knew at FreshBooks we wanted to have strong technical and management roles. And we wanted to have the same number of levels with comparable scope and responsibility across both paths. So one path shouldn't be easier or faster to move along than the other. Using this information, I started holding one-on-ones and I created small working groups uh, of people to answer questions. So for the uh, goals of the technical path, I started with this first because I felt like this was more referenced during our exit interviews and therefore was a bigger problem. So in our working groups, we started asking the following questions. What are our expectations of our engineers from our most junior to our most senior? What is the right number of steps for people to have a sense of progression along the technical path? And how do we evolve our engineering ladder so that it is able, enables us to provide more consistency in evaluating and promoting, uh, promoting people while still giving people flexibility in their career? In addition, we wanted for our technical path people to have the opportunity to progressively take on more ambitious technical pro uh, problems so that they could build up their skills and experience. And we wanted this to be possible regardless of which team that they were working on. So we decided to leverage something that was loosely based on Google's 20% time, where, which we called innovation days. And people can book these throughout the years, kind of like you book vacation, uh, and they take this out of, uh, the, as an opportunity to showcase their technical leadership, as well as build breadth and depth in any area of their choosing. So once I had a line on the different, uh, different uh, goals of the technical path, I moved on to the management path. This time, the questions were, what are our expectations for the different levels of leadership? What is the right number of steps for people to have a sense of progression along the management path? And how do we evolve our career ladder to enable more consistency in evaluating and promoting people while still giving people flexibility in their career? So you might notice, if you're very clever, oops, that these goals are very similar to the technical path. They should sound and look familiar. So regardless of which path someone would be interested in, we needed to make sure that it had clear expectations, clear progression, and we were consistent in applying it. And in addition, for the management path, we wanted to have opportunities for people to gradually build up their skills. What we found that often people felt really overwhelmed when they started going into any kind of management role because they really hadn't had enough time to develop into this role. So our third step was reviewing our existing organizational structure. Basically, this is when we started asking questions. Is our structure helping or harming our efforts to scale? So one area of the organization that I felt really needed revisiting was that team lead role I talked about earlier. So at FreshBooks, the team lead role was really the only way of progression along the path after senior engineer. It effectively gave all the responsibility to one person, and it gave little opportunities for other people on the team to lead projects or really get exposure outside of the team. So when someone became a team lead, they had to quickly ramp up into management, and they often felt overwhelmed. And since the expectations weren't clearly defined, they weren't sure where to focus their time and energy. So they were giving a lot of responsibility, but no real clear direction on accountability. 
And this joint management and technical role also really frustrated people who are only interested in technical path. And it left us with a gap in leadership across, an or, across the organization because we had too many people in this role that weren't really interested in management or leadership. We also found it relatively challenging to hire for this role because it gave a lot of management uh, responsibility for someone who wasn't even an engineering manager. So in the new career ladder, we decided to remove the team lead role by shifting some of those responsibilities to the sen senior engineers and also the engineering manager. So I wanna really take a moment to highlight the importance of transparency in this process. When I first had this idea of, of removing the team lead roles, I started talking with the team leads right away. Obviously, this created some anxiety because there was a lot of uncertainty. I wasn't even sure if we would or would not do this, but it also helped build trust that we wanted to make changes that would be beneficial for everyone and that we weren't planning to spring something on them unexpectedly. So starting the conversation early allowed us to get feedback on the potential changes and what it would mean to them and also iterate on how we wanted to bring in those changes. And I think too often in senior leadership, we have a tendency to do things in secrecy. And this is really an opportunity to build a better working relationship with everyone in your org. Removing the team lead roles role was gonna effectively change people's careers and their professional identity. So it couldn't be taken lightly and transparency was the key. Okay, so let's now talk more specifically on the new engineering career ladder that we created at FreshBooks. Building your new engineering career ladder is step four of our process. When we got to this step at FreshBooks, we knew the general direction that we wanted to go, but this is where we really started articulating our career growth philosophy and working out all the details. So this is a visual representation of the new uh, technical path. You can see my background is in back-end developer, not a front-end developer. Uh, so on the technical path, before we made changes to our career ladder, we actually had a progression of levels to senior engineer. And then after that, we had a progression of levels to principal engineer. But if you recall, people didn't really feel that, that uh, it was really possible to get to principal engineer from the earlier levels. And that was in part because these levels were poorly defined. And so therefore they were never really used in practice. So what did we end up with uh, is right here. Uh, we ended up with two well-defined interim levels between senior engineer and principal engineer. We also added an additional architect role uh, at the same level as principal engineer. And, uh, we thought that this would be the right level of, uh, sorry, the right number of levels uh, for people to have that progression, and it was also consistent with many other companies. And we are prepared to add more levels when necessary, like senior principal engineer or senior architect, and I actually look forward to when we'll have been able to grow someone to that position or, or hire them. And this is the corresponding uh, visual representation of the management path. So in our old management career ladder, we could have people promoted to team lead, usually from senior engineer, but sometimes from the level below. And then we had a series of team lead levels that moved on to engineering manager. An engineering manager was at the same level as principal engineer, and the director, who obviously was in the department, didn't even appear on our career ladder. So I found that very confusing, and so did everyone else. So more often than not, the reality of the roles were not well reflected in our engineering ladder. So when we redefine this management path, we really focus on creating those well-defined roles. And now we have a path that's very easy to follow. And this new path, we also shifted some of that uh, opportunities and responsibilities earlier on. So that, that gives people opportunity to build up those leadership skills much er uh, earlier and in a more gradual way. So you might see, if you're looking closely, that this has the same amount of levels as the new, uh, as the technical path I showed earlier. So this, as I mentioned before, was deliberate. And it, I'll explain how we created those comparable expectations on the different paths. So one of the things that we aligned at right from the beginning at FreshBooks is that career progression for us meant that you, uh, it, the, the career progression evolved from the impact and the influence people had on progressively larger areas of the organization. So let me give you an example of that. In our old career ladder, we would have expectations that a junior developer would write tests. You know, maybe they'd be missing some, but they'd write tests. Our senior developer would also write tests. And as a developer became more senior, they should be writing you know, more tests than in the junior, engineer, uh, junior developer. So basically, the expectations were the same in some respect, but the senior, uh, seniors did it better. 
Okay, so I will admit that testing was a particularly weak area of our uh, old career ladder, but I think it's good as a comparable example. So now in the new ladder, we'll expect everyone to write the necessary amount of tests. What changes for us now is that they, for a senior uh, uh, developer, the expectations include a, that they're supposed to have a broader impact on the org, such as them working to improve the test framework or maybe speed up the performance of the test. So they're no longer the same expectations as the earlier levels. And we categorize this change of impact and influence that people have on different levels as contribute, manage, and lead. So this categorization helps us determine what levels in the two paths are equivalent to each other in impact and in influence. And we're going to be looking at expectations in the different levels in the engineering ladder through this lens. So in the new ladder, we grouped expectations at each level into four categories. When I was doing those small working groups that I touched upon earlier, I found that expectations fell into consistent categories of mastery, communication, results, and maturity. So obviously naming is hard for engineers, so uh, these aren't the best names, but they're good enough for now, and so we're sticking with them. Uh, so mastery refers to the breadth and the depth of the core skills for the job. So for a back-end developer, that might be the knowledge and application of design patterns. For an engineering manager, that might be building high-performing teams. Communication is going to include elements of feedback, of collaboration, or critique, sharing knowledge, uh, maybe handling conflict. So someone in the contribute stage of sharing knowledge might be updating documentations of the, on their project, but someone in the lead stage might be communicating a technical or management initiative throughout the org. Uh, results is getting things done. I think we're all familiar with results. So that's planning, scoping, estimating, prioritizing, and so forth. So someone in the early stages might be just focused on their own time and priorities, while someone in the later stages might be leading an initiative that's uh, cross-organizational. And our last category, maturity, includes elements of self-awareness, of perseverance, uh, the ability to handle failure, maybe the ability to uh, handle uncertainty. And so early on with junior engineers, we often do see this as uh, the ability to work with problems that are not very well defined, while in later parts of their career feeling very comfortable with vague requirements and much less data. So in our new ladder, all the levels leading up to and including the senior engineer, we consider the foundational levels. So we expect all junior engineers to be able to grow to the senior level, and each level of the ladder builds on top of one another. But once an engineer has achieved the foundational levels, they can build upon different skills towards a more technical-focused or management-focused path. So an engineer focusing in one area, whether that be technical or management, it just means that it's their primary focus. It doesn't mean that that has to be their only focus. And that's what allows us to have some flexibility in our career ladder, because we do recognize that everyone is unique and everyone's path in their career is going to be unique. So flexibility could mean that you would have an engineering manager that still is spending some of their time coding, or you might have someone on the technical path that has maybe one or two people reporting, them, reporting to them so that they can mentor them. Okay, and now we've gotten to step five, which is creating transition plans for existing uh, engineers. So, let's be honest, most of us are not going to be creating a career ladder when we hire our first engineer. More often than not, we're going to be creating and updating a ladder for existing engineers already in the building. We're never so lucky also that everyone in the building is going to map perfectly onto your new ladder, which is why we have to create individual transition plans as well as provide a transitional period of adjustment for everyone. So at FreshBooks, we hold managers accountable to assess their existing folk to determine gaps and work with people to create individual plans to map or grow them to the new levels within a reasonable timeline. And I also wanted to really mention that for our team leads, the ones where we no longer have a team lead role, right? We, they still keep their title and their role until we transition them to an engineering manager or a more senior technical role. Uh, we're not pulling the rug under anyone's uh, feet. Okay, so I haven't gone really in depth right now about any particular expectations we have on each level and path in our new engineering career ladder. And that's because, for the most part, we don't believe that um, specific languages, frameworks, and technologies uh, belong on a career ladder. These things are constantly changing, and therefore they're not well served in a career ladder. So, uh, at FreshBooks, a front-end developer is going to work with the same career ladder as a back-end developer, and we're going to assess their impact and influence the same way. 
But that being said, it is useful to look at specifically at some of these skills. So we're working to supplement our career ladder with a technology skills matrix. So our goal is for managers and for engineers to use this technology skills matrix for training and growth purposes. And it's also really helpful for us to be able to uh, identify and address any skills gap in our existing department, which is going to be critical for scaling our engineering talent and building up our organization further. So I really love this quote, uh, because I really believe it, it applies to growing your engineering careers. They, I, I've talked about a lot of things that we've done so far, and you might be thinking, well, that's a lot of work. <laughs> do I really need to do that? So I just want to say, this is what Henry Ford say, and, I, and I, I say the same thing. The only thing worse than training your employees and having them leave is not training them and having them stay. So the more you invest in your engineers' careers, the more value they're going to bring to your organization. So it's definitely an investment worth uh, making. So let's continue. Okay, we're still not ready to roll out our career ladder because, of course, we need to define our measurements of success to know whether or not we're focusing on the right things. So this is step six. So these are some of the metrics that FreshBooks is interested in. Obviously, people have their own, but the ones that we're uh, tracking is our overall retention rate, our distribution among levels among the technical and the management path, uh, the average tenure of an engineer at FreshBooks, and whether that's going up or down over time. We're looking at the proportion of engineers that have been promoted into a senior leadership position, whether it be technical or management, versus the ones that we've, been, uh, we've hired uh, people into it. We're also looking at the distribution of men and women along the different paths and levels, as well as the turnover of men and women, and voluntary versus involuntary uh, departures as well. And future metrics that we're potentially looking to track is the turnover rate of high performers specifically, the number of promotions someone has during their tenure, and lateral moves between roles as well. And currently, with respect to diversity, we do only track uh, gender, but we will be expanding this in the future. So. We finally reached step seven, yay, which is launch and communicate your new engineering career ladder. So it's obviously very important that everyone in your senior leadership um, group helps communicate the details of the new ladder. It's literally the responsibility of everyone. But at FreshBooks, we also leverage the support of our team leads to spread the word and to build the excitement about this new career ladder. And this was especially powerful because if you recall, team leads are the ones that were most affected by this change. And so their public support of the new ladder was really critical to get people's buy-in. And they're also the people who work more directly with engineers in the department on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So they not only need to be well-educated about the changes, but they have to be supportive of them as well. One of the things that we did at FreshBooks is that we had a soft launch before we did an uh, official launch. And this was to help people understand the changes that we were uh, bringing about. So we released the new engineering career ladder right before our performance review period, but we didn't set expectations that people would be assessed against it right away. Instead, we used it to discuss expectations going forward. And so this allowed us to get direct feedback from what people found confusing and what needed to be improved. Our goal wasn't to get a perfect engineering ladder, but one that would be uh, good enough for us to be able to start getting value from it immediately. And we also wanted to share it as a work in progress to make sure people understood we didn't see it as like precious and that in fact we were very eager to get feedback uh, and incorporate that feedback. So having a soft launch also helps with transparency on what is coming up in the future for people uh, and, and let them prepare for what's, how they're going to be assessed in the future. Uh, so that's definitely something that I highly recommend. So after a couple of months, we did officially launch the new career ladder. And although we had been communicating these changes throughout the process, at this point, we really doubled down on communication. We provided talking points for managers. We uh, had multiple information sessions. We had Q and A's in small groups. And this was also that people could ask questions and get clarifications. And then we set expectations that although we would still uh, take feedback, we were going to let the career ladder soak for a bit at this point and not make any further changes. Change is always hard for people and people need time to adapt and we didn't want to, uh, we want to be reducing thrash during that time. So in step eight, we finally put the new engineering career ladder into action so that we can attract, engage and retain high performing engineering talent and help us scale. So once you have clear expectations at each level in both the technical and management path, it's a lot easier to bring consistency and reduce bias from the recruitment process. People have a framework to follow when assessing candidates. 
And it also helps, it can also help to bring more diversity into your org because you can become more flexible on how someone's demonstrating achieving some of those expectations. So it can enable you to widen your pool of potential candidates and increase the probability of getting someone great into your open roles. And for us, it's been especially helpful in determining whether a candidate is junior or senior. Uh, because in, in our case, we are able to look at the impact and the influence this individual will have across the org. So we also believe that the engineering career ladder is a critical tool in providing meaningful feedback uh, during one-on-ones. Performance management is obviously something that should be an ongoing discussion and people shouldn't have surprises during their review period. So the career ladder can help you identify areas of focus and also allow people to make choices on some of the things they might want to uh, explore and focus next in their career. And similarly to the recruitment process, uh, once you have clear expectations for the different levels, it's a lot easier to bring consistency and reduce bias in the promotion process as well. So for engineers, we do have comparable levels and use the same progression philosophy, areas of development, and promotion philosophy between the technical and management path. So we actually made a lot of changes to our promotion process to tie it more closely with our engineering ladder uh, and ensure we were being consistent in applying it. To so some key elements that I wanted to really uh, discuss were that we try to create opportunities for growth and we focus on performance. We're strict on expectation, but very flexible on someone can demonstrate achieving them. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, you know, some people are going to be very comfortable standing up in a crowd and sharing knowledge, if you, if you want to call it that. Some people, it's worse face than death. So on the other hand, they might be perfectly happy to write a, a blog post about it or have a small training session for a few other engineers, right? So people can demonstrate that they are sharing knowledge and in a lot of different ways. And we don't care how they're doing it. We just care that they are doing it. So that's where we get strict on expectations, but flexible on how someone demonstrates achieving them. So we also tie justification of why a promotion is warranted directly into the career ladder and expectation. And we compare our reasons of why we promote someone or we don't promote someone uh, across different people to make sure we're consistent. We also compare uh, individuals uh, across their current level and at the proposed level. And then we also review our metrics to see if, if we have any hidden biases. And if the promotion doesn't go ahead, it should always be very clear to the manager and the individual on what the next steps are and the areas they should be focusing on. Okay, let's do a quick recap of our steps. Uh, here are the eight steps that we took at FreshBooks to redefine our career ladder, change our organizational structure, and update our processes. So first of all, you got to identify that changes are needed, and this could be due to metrics or maybe feedback from your engineers. Then do your research. Every company is going to be unique, but people do have a universal need for clarity and progression in their career. In step three, you're going to review your existing organizational structure. This is where you ask yourself, is our, my current structure helping or hindering us? And be as transparent as possible to build trust in this, in this step. In step four, you build your new engineering career ladder. And remember that both technical and management paths are important. Having comparable levels at the different paths is really the key to ensuring they both carry equal weight in your org. And make sure you have a clear progression philosophy. Like I had mentioned before, at FreshBooks, our progression philosophy is that career progression evolves from the impact and influence someone has at increasingly uh, larger areas of the org. In step five, you're going to create transition uh, plans for your existing engineers. In step six, you're going to define how you're going to measure success. You need to do this before you launch your new ladder and processes. In step seven, you're going to communicate your new engineering career ladder. Remember to use as many of your leaders as you can. And finally, in step eight, you could integrate the existing career ladder into your recruitment, performance, and promotion processes. So, if and when you decide to tackle your engineering career ladder, here's some additional tips and learnings. Uh, one of the biggest challenges can be that you prioritize this work ahead of other projects where you would see a more immediate impact, right? This is a long-term project and it has long-term impact. So it's really important to set realistic timelines and milestones. And I also urge you to look at the big picture. For your organization, the engineering career ladder might only be one part of a bigger change that you need to make. But I do believe it's a foundational one. Okay, so where are we at FreshBooks now? So since we launched our new engineering career ladder uh, and changed our organizational structure and update our processes about a year ago, 
our junior and senior engineers have had more opportunities to build technical and management leadership skills. Our recruitment process has been enabled us to more quickly hire new engineers and scale our department, while our performance review process is leveraging our new ladder to help engineers identify and set their new personal development goals. Our promotion process has enabled us to confidently promote people into higher roles while providing clear feedback to, those, to, to help people see the necessary things they need to do to move to their next level. We've already had one team lead become an engineering manager, while another one has moved away from the management path to take the next step on her path to see, uh, uh, principal engineer. Our turnover in our department is almost half compared to this time last year. More team leads have indicated that they're pursuing the technical path, while we still have some working towards the management path. Both paths are now viable and supported career choices at FreshBooks. Our leadership initiatives are making traction to the work of enthusiastic individuals, and we have an increasingly larger pool of technical talent to draw upon to work on our most challenging problems. Our new ladder, organizational structure and processes are helping us scale, which is holding us back. And with that, I want to leave you with a few last words, not mine, but Richard Branson's, because I think this sums it up very well. His full quote is, my philosophy has always been, if you could put your staff first, your customers second, and shareholders third, effectively, in the end, the shareholders do well, the customers do better, and yourself are happy. So thank you for listening. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn and hear from you about your own company, any scaling challenges you've faced, and any solutions you've implemented. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I questions. As you're racing around, the thing I also wanted to mention is I know I'm a fast speaker, but this is being videotaped. It is a beautiful weekend, so you can get a beer, kick back, and watch this at half speed. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Um, actually, it's very interesting um, to hear the story of FreshBooks because uh, where, where I'm at connected, we actually just went through like an eight-month review of our mm -hmm. career progression, and we came up with a very similar approach yep. like almost across the board. Um, the question I have for you specifically is around um, how do you help those on the technical path who don't want to go deep on, on the technical path but mm -hmm. want to be more of a breath fo uh, focused uh, engineer. So like instead of going deep technically making more impact on a single technology, yep. how do you handle people who want to go more breath and focus on multiple technologies? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question because I think at FreshBooks we've often had the reverse where we've had a lot of people and we really put a lot of emphasis on breadth and it was really actually people who wanted to go really deep that we saw as, oh, that's too narrow, they don't know enough across the field, right? So I think you have to embrace both those things uh, and you have to find a balancing act. So you're going to have your specialists and you're going to have your people who can bring it all together. Uh, and in some ways that's what we're trying to create, some of these like additional roles in our career ladder. Uh, but what, like within that role, you might have a, a principal engineer that's a specialist in a certain area, or you might have someone who's more like a system integrator uh, across it. And I think both of those should be able to uh, be possible. Right. The interesting thing mm -hmm. is like, because that was the challenge for us. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that our solution, our, one of our solutions was to actually create a different path, uh, mm -hmm. more of a breadth of path, breadth path. So we call it the product engineer path, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot more. Uh, it's actually familiar across other companies too. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies do that as well. So that was one of our solutions because we had the exact same challenge. Okay, that's really true. I'd love to connect with you about that. Yeah. Uh, right now we've tried to kind of provide flexibility both those packs in our existing uh, ladder, but it is something I'm really interested in finding if you're further along in the process, for instance, is if uh, there could be value for us as well to start differentiating it a bit more. Yeah, thank is it on? Yep. Yeah. Thanks for that presentation. That was great. Um, so in this uh, analysis and design and rollout, mm -hmm. how much of it was led by technical leadership like yourself mm -hmm. or the HR department? So in some ways, I feel like we didn't leverage HR enough. I did a lot of the heavy lifting. And it's not till the end that I really started working more closely with our HR uh, counterpart. and. 
I do think it's something that has to be led from within the engineering department personally, and that, that could be my own bias. But I also do think that you should leverage the HR department because they are very good at thinking at these things at a higher level and how to roll them out. So I've, I got a lot of value when I started incorporating in HR into it, and they especially were very helpful when I was thinking about the whole rollout. And uh, it was on there. It was like really working with them that we decided to do the soft launch versus the hard launch because I think I would have just been like, let's do it, let's go for it, right? And so they have a lot of learnings that they could bring to that process, yeah. But it is a collaboration. It's, I don't think it's something you can pass over to your HR department at all. And in the, um, like when we were doing those working groups, a lot of that, like I was working with the principal engineers, like we were really trying to define what are our expectations. And I don't think, I think there's too much domain knowledge in there to pass it on to HR for that. Okay, great. And just a quick follow-up. Um, you mentioned in your slides that it's really important that the two tracks have uh, comparable uh, value and hence compensation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that exactly true, including equity, or just approximately true? Oh, that's an interesting question you asked about equity. I think, you know, if I just have to think about it right now off, uh, off the top of my head, I would say yes. Okay. Because the whole point to us, in order to make, especially on the technical track, very often you can have people go into management because really that's how they make more money, that's where they have more impact. If you're not giving that same uh, ability to influence and that same ability to have that scope on the technical path, it will always be a second class citizen. And that's where you're going to end up losing you know, brilliant technical people, they're now doing a role that they're, they're, they're not taking full advantage of that. So I think, and any one you're going to ask me, I'm going to say yes, comparable. <laughs> yeah. And we are, I didn't actually mention it here, but we are actually, the stuff I'm working on right now, as well as the, the technology skills matrix, is also really working with our HR department on our comp compensation model to make sure that we're really embracing that to like full and, uh, full and through. Yeah. Um, Kind of an inverse question to that. Now that you've introduced the sup, oh, thank you. Hi. Uh, now that you've introduced the two tracks, have you noticed uh, junior developers saying that, oh, I would never go into management. I'm afraid <laughs> of like those big suits and being that stuffy person. And if so, uh, how do you counteract with that, or is that kind of no longer an issue? Uh, so, I mean, as someone in management, I, I hope they're not calling me a stuffy suit, but uh, I, I actually embrace that because I feel like people have to go into management when that is their passion. Like, the problem we had is we had too many people going into management that had no interest in it. And that's a terrible situation for a company to be in. And, and it's extremely disheartening for someone trying to get something off the ground when anytime you're bringing up an idea and initiatives and you have like total blank faces looking at you, can we go back to our desk and code now? And you're thinking, you're supposed to be the leaders here, right? So. I'm not concerned about not enough people wanting to go into management. I think once you get a few people who have a real passion for it, they start really running with it and they're really able to show others like what's all the possibility and they build that momentum that when so that other people who have interest in it, they go in it. So we haven't had that issue. We have a lot of people who right now are like, I also run the co-op program. I'm always having people like, hey, can we get more co-ops? Everyone wants to mentor them. Everyone wants to be part of it. So now that, it's almost like we haven't, we've told people you don't have to make a choice, you have to make a primary focus. I feel like it's an enabling people to be more willing to explore a role that they hadn't thought about in the past because they know it's not a door is now closing if they go in that direction. Um, I was curious about the, the time gap between the communication and mm -hmm. the rollout and the potential for uh, fear and uncertainty mm -hmm. to, to, to build, to build <laughs> yeah, yeah. when people were wondering like, okay, well, yeah. how is this going to affect me personally mm -hmm. when yeah. I saw that and, and how you dealt with it? Yeah. Yo, no, no, that's a really, really good question. And even the fact, we saw that even earlier, as I mentioned before, even when we were like, when I started thinking, like, I'm constantly, you know, have my little drawings trying to figure out how this path could map. And it was just constantly like, I got to get rid of this team lead role. I got to get rid of this team lead role, right? So the first people I went to on that was to the team leads. And this is the expression. They're like, what? What, what does that mean for me, right? Like, any time you're doing an organizational change, the first question people are going to ask, how does it apply to me, right? So I feel that the... Part of the reason I really wanted to talk about the soft launch is that in any case, you're always going to have that fear and uncertainty. The more you can do is try to give people time to adjust, give people support during that adjustment period. So 
I don't think that period before the official launch built up more uncertainty. I think it reduced it because we were really, um, we really tried to communicate that this is not yet in stone. This is the direction we're thinking. We still really, really want your feedback. So we did shift things. Uh, people like people come up with great ideas and suggestions, and I think the way because we were showing that we were responding to that, I think that helped build confidence that this is not this is a good thing. Uh, and right now, uh, anytime people come to me about it, I would say is like more like okay, we want even more. Like when are we gonna? Because like one of the things is, for instance, I was identifying that even though we do performance management, sorry, not performance management, management training for our leaders. We don't give them practical. We give them, how do you deliver feedback? I mean, I guess that's practical, but it's much more of the management philosophy. How do you be a leader? How do you be a manager? We don't say, okay, you have a poor performer. How the hell do you fill out a PIP or something like that? When should you do it? When should you not? How do you give someone a bonus? How do, all those kinds of things. So we also, uh, hopefully this fall, we can start um, working more on that, but that's another area we want to put in. But I think I've lost my train of thought. Uh, so there's lots of things you still have to do, is I guess I'll go with there. Uh, but I, I always feel like ignorance is not going to make people uh, less fearful. The more they know, the more they can uh, relax. I don't know how to say it, but yeah. Ignorance is not the answer. Hi, um, two-part question. Yeah. Uh, curious what your ratio of managers to reports is. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that you sort of distributed the workload of technical leadership between your ICs and managers. And so I'm just curious how, what, what yeah, that looks like. Yeah. So with the first one, I don't have, I don't, even though I did run stats and numbers to have like graphs, I, I was already going over time, so I took them out. Uh, I would say we, we re usually we have the, I think even this was talked about tech at scale last time, we usually don't want mo one manager to have more than eight people, let's say. Um, and so that could be, that would be eight direct reports, right? So like I might have eight uh, managers, but then they'll have, that's fine. It's just like, how many do you have that one-on-one -on -one relationship? In certain teams, uh, that might be much smaller if we're, if that individual is spending a lot of time, like for instance, I'm kicking off kind of like this growth hacking team, that's a very small team right now because there's so much of additional stuff that manager needs to be thinking of uh, than just, uh, uh, they're not in the operational stage yet, right? So to me, the, the balance is going to shift depending on what that team is doing and what stage that team is in, right? If you have a high performing team, that's in a different state than when you have an entirely new team that you're kicking off and so forth. I forgot your second question was... Oh yeah. Yeah, so I think that was actually one of the areas that people were very concerned about because uh, one, we were trying to say, hey, we're going to give you more opportunities to try something versus committing, right? On the other hand, what people heard was, you're going to give us more responsibility, but we're going to be paid the same amount and be doing the same role, right? So one of the things that we're doing is we're changing our compensation model for that. But the bigger thing is, is what we want is for people to, instead of, you know, the thing is, when you become a manager, this is now your job, right? But on the technical side, you can often have much more flexibility because you can say, I'm going to be, you could put your hand up for a particular project, and when that's done, and you finished leading it, you can go back to your IC role, right? We want to have that same type of flexibility on the more management side, so we have people who are interested in the management path, for instance, you know, they might have a a co-op for a certain amount of time, and then they go. They may be part of an initiative that we're trying to kick up, kick off to do some organizational changes, because that's one of the things we really focus on, is that especially as you get more senior, your focus should not just be within the team, uh, and to try to help your own team be high-performing. The, the goal is to try to create the whole department to be high-performing, right? So it is, a, it is like a balancing act between how much additional and how much people want. Um, and we're still in the... Uh, like certain things are working, certain things are not working. I would say they're more working than not working, which is why I'm here today to talk to you about it. Uh, but it is something that it's like, it's not a, a A, B kind of situation, yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. It was really great and informative. Uh, I'm curious if you've run into any challenges when it comes to the application of the new framework, mm -hmm. both in hiring and for from transitioning existing team members where 
there might be a misalignment in the level they yeah. believe they're at and the level that you perceive them to be at? Yeah. And has that caused any issues, departures even yeah. from the company? Yeah. So I would say on the recruitment side, it's really, really helped us. On the recruitment and promotion side, it's really helped us because to me, uh, I felt like it was too loosey-goosey before. The, now there's really clear reasons why you are wanting to uh, bring in a candidate or why you want to promote that person. So there right now, I have not seen any detriments to it. It's only been positive. But you do raise a really good point on that mapping. Uh, I mentioned you have to create the transition plan. There has to be a transition period. There are people in our org, I don't know if I feel confident they're going to come out at, through the end of the transition period at the right, like they're going to come out successfully. And I could see that as a failure, but instead I see that as a success is because everyone has people in their org that they're like, well, they're doing a good job, but they're, you know, here I feel like now we have actually, we can identify why we're not promoting them, why we're not like, yeah, they're a high performer and so forth, right? And now we're giving them that opportunity to have that conversation with them, saying these are expectations. It's no longer, you know, I, I never ever want to fire someone without them understanding why and them understanding and having time to try to address those things. So to me, that's the responsibility I have uh, more than anything else. And, and to me, that the uh, having these clear expectations now enables me to be very direct in my feedback and give that, per and now it's in their hands of what they want to do with it. But obviously we, we provide support. We, if there are like real gaps on things, I have, you know, uh, you know, I have people's and people's, uh, um, what are they called? Performance reviews. You need, need to do this. You need to take this training program. You need to do this. Like there, there are specific things that often people can do to fill those gaps. Yeah. Yeah. So what you presented here feels a little bit like a, uh, a roadmap for a, a redesign of a mm -hmm. career ladder. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's also a way to do smaller incremental changes mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis, or do you have to keep it stable? No, I actually think that's a really great question. So I, would, I, I was comparing it earlier to your code, right? There are times that you, you want to make small little adjustments, right? But sometimes you have to make a, a relatively big one. Sometimes those big ones can be very disruptive, but you, sometimes you can't do it only in small, small changes, right? Uh, and I think it's the same in these kinds of things. So in certain processes, I would say we're always going to be looking over what's working, what's not. Um, I really liked Margaret's talk about like compliance and making things easier. Right now, our promotion process is way more heavy-handed. People have to fill out stuff. I think that's really important. We are doing this right now. People have clear reasons why they want to promote someone. But once we get really, really good at it, I want to take away some of the additional work for people. I'm hoping we can find more streamlined ways. So I think like, as, a, as an agile kind of mindset, you're always trying to find ways to make it, uh, to make it better. And I think that's not something you have to wait to do it as a big bang. Uh, it's just sometimes you, you, you really realize it's gone too far and you need to do a big bang, right? And I always, I always think it's super important is like, I'm not dissing on our old career ladder. And I hate when people diss on old software too. It's like, it did what it needed to do at the time, but it's a different people, different situation, different environment. You have different needs. And that's when you know you need to start changing it. Yeah.